Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome. This is Music Mondays, and we are super excited to have the guests that we have today. Um, guys, you do not want to miss this interview. Please like, tag, share, invite somebody to watch along with you because you want to hear what our guest has to say today. She is an excellent, phenomenal uh, voice and vocalist within our community and within our arts industry, and I'm so excited to have her with us. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Renee West, and I am the founder of Alia School of Art. Um, you can check us out online at www.aliaschoolofart.com. Once again, that's A-L-I-Y-A-H, Alia School of Art, singular, .com. And please follow us, like us on Facebook and Instagram at, again, Alia School of Art, A-L-I-Y-A-H. Well, without further ado, Ms. Jeanette Berry, I'm so excited to have you here with me today. How are you? I am well. I cannot complain. That's excellent. Well, that's excellent. I'm so happy to hear that. And I'm super happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited um, just to be in conversation with you. <laughs> Great. Well, I guys, you guys are in for a treat. Um, you guys are going to have an opportunity to hear some of her music today and um, she is a phenomenal songwriter. Um, she's just a phenomenal writer in general. But um, once you hear your music, I, 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 once you hear her music, excuse me, I guarantee you're going to be addicted. Uh, she's a, a beautiful tonality and just an excellent way of telling a story through the song. So, Miss Jeanette Berry, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what compelled you into your professional career within vocal performance? Yeah, so I am from New York originally, Long Island to be specific, and um, both of my, right, both of my parents are in music. My dad's a musician, plays saxophone and cello, and my mother's a singer, actress, and dancer. They're also both educators. Um, so I have grown up around the arts my entire life. My grandmother had a dance school in our basement. Um, so just, that's just, it's, it's in my blood. Um, so kind of just, I was born with it. Um, and I've always known that I could sing and I've always known that I wanted to sing. And I guess just knowing that and knowing that it was inside of me, I just was like, well, there's nothing else to do but to do it. So I did it. I just followed the the steps in getting to the place that I, that I saw myself being. Um, and that in, included singing in church, singing uh, in, in um, summer programs, singing in high school, then going to college for, for musical theater first and then for music and, you know, just keep going from there. It's all about just keep it going. So, yeah. Wow. So you are a New York baby. Yes. I am, I'm really impressed. Well, I had no idea that your family was so steeped in the arts. What was the name of your grandmother? So my mother's, uh, my grandmother's name was Inez Wincoop or Inez de Vega. Um, her and her sister actually were dancers at the Cotton Club. My, my aunt found a picture and it was so cool. Like they were the de Vega sisters. They tap danced and they danced at the Cotton Club. Um, so like I have a very rich New York art history um, within my bloodline. And so I, I try to honor that with everything that I do so yeah truly beautiful I love it and what was the name of her dance studio that she had in the basement that's a good question um I don't know the name of the school um but I what I do know is that when she got a little older the I think it was the the black mothers in Westbury where I'm from got together to do a mother's group of Westbury and she created a arts program through that. And then my mother took that on to create her summer programs um, and took that on as well. Um, and did that until she, she couldn't really anymore just for health reasons. And yeah, it's been in our, it's been in our family ever since the mother's group of Westbury, so. Whoa, that's incredible. A long line of innovators and artists 
excellent. So I had no idea that you started off in musical theater and then you transitioned to um, voice performance. Now, can you tell us where you went to school and tell us a little bit about that transition? Yeah, uh, so I went to school at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. <laughs> and, um, I, when I saw, so I was in high school for musical theater. I went to a performing arts high school on Long Island and I, my major was musical theater with a minor in vocal performance. And so I always had just regular plain singing in there, always music, the music background. And when I got to, I loved musical theater because, you know, it was the performing, it was the storytelling, it was putting acting and dancing, all of that. So at one point in my life, I wanted to be on Broadway. I don't actually remember that point of my life, but I know it was in there, um, probably high school, because that's when I was like enveloped in all of that stuff. And so when I, I went to my guidance counselor's office and saw, oh no, it was my music office in my main school, saw the big shot from UArts and was like, I'm going there. Um, and to my parents' chagrin, I said, if I don't get into UArts, I'm not going to college. <laughs> I'm just gonna try and figure it out. But I did get in and I went in as a musical theater major, spent a year and a half in musical theater. And then in the middle of my sophomore year, I was taking Meisner technique, um, an acting technique. And I was like, I don't know if this is for me. There's not enough music. I'm not challenged musically. I wanna be challenged musically. I don't wanna be pigeonholed as an actor um, because of my looks or because of the way I sing. So I wanna, I wanna be able to have more freedom. And so I was already in music ensembles in, uh, on the other side of the school because I was just like, this is how I roll. Like, I'm just gonna be doing a whole lot. So I was, and um, I spoke to some teachers and I was like, yeah, I think it's time for me to change my major. So went on and changed my major in the middle of my sophomore year um, to vocal jazz performance with a music ed minor um, and did that all in just an extra semester. So that was great. <laughs> Wow. Oh my goodness, guys, we are getting to know Miss Jeanette Berry. <laughs> wow. Yes. I Now, I know that I met you at the University of Arts. Big up to University of Arts, both of our alma maters. Um, I, I was the same way. I had several schools that I wanted to go to, but I said, I'm going to UArts. <laughs> no one can stop me. I'm going. Um, but that is so interesting. I had no idea that you were in the musical department. Actually, I, when I started off, I was in the CAD department and I transferred to the theater department. So I guess we must have missed each other in the midst of the transfer. You were already in the music department. But um, that's, that's excellent. Wow. So I want to take a step back and I just want to ask, were there any people or were there any figures in your life that really encouraged you or kind of pushed you along in your journey, your vocal journey? or artistic journey, if that's what you want to speak to? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, so I had a, I didn't grow up in a, well, I grew up in church, but it was the United Methodist Church. So it was very traditional um, hymns, um, things like that. We didn't, it wasn't um, what people would might normally think a singer grows up in the church singing gospel. That was not my experience. Um, but my church family was my extended family. I won't even say second family, it's my extended family. And there were so many people at that church when I was growing up who were elders in the community, who I had a lot of respect for, who also nurtured not only my music, but me as a person. And they always saw the best in me. You would go, I would go out outside of my church family and sing and people would be like, oh my God, you need to be on American Idol. You need to do this, you need to do that. But in my church family, it was just like, do what you're supposed to do. Do it for the reasons you're supposed to do it. Like, don't let anybody tell you why you should be doing this. You know why you're doing this. Don't let the outside world tell you what you're doing um, or what to do. And so um, that was huge. My choir director from church, Mr. Glover, we're now like we, I talk to him all the time. Um, one of my biggest, um, my, my middle school, then high school music teacher, Mr. Kelvin Jenkins, 
was a huge influence, humongous. Um, I was so, I will never forget this. He left the middle school to go to the high school and it was only like one year, but I couldn't wait to get back to get to the high school so I could have him as my teacher. Um, so Mr. Jenkins, um, Mr. Glover, um, there were a couple other musicians in my church that had such a big impact. Um, and then my parents, of course, well, my parents were always a little hands off. They're like, we're not gonna give you lessons. If this is what you wanna do, you do it. We're not gonna try and mold you into what we think you want. We want you to be, we want you to be your own person. Um, so it was, I had, I had a truly blessed growing up in the, in the way that people always supported what I wanted to do. Um, whether that support came from wanting to kind of be on my coattails or just the support was genuine. So I'm, I'm definitely blessed in that, in that way. Well, that is very interesting to learn. Excellent. I love it. And I love what you said about learning how not to allow outside influences to contribute to what you're doing, but doing what you're doing for the right reasons. I think that's so important in this day and age. So now let's bring it to now, here and now. So you have released some new singles as of late. Um, you have your new single, Solavant, as well as Space and Timing. Can you talk to us a little bit about those two projects? Yeah, so the first one is Solivagon. Two, three. What is it about me that makes me hard to love? What do I show the world that makes them weary of? The way I talk, the way I move, the way I love so hard, it's true. What is it about me that makes me hard to love? Um, it is a word, it's okay. Um, it is a, so last year I went through some stuff emotionally and was like, you know what? I need to write it. And some of it was written and some of it, I was just like, I just need to get it out. I need to record it. This needs to be kind of out of my system. Um, so I spent a couple months, September to December, I had three sessions, um, three separate sessions recording these three songs for the Salivagon EP. Um, and I saw the word once on like, I don't know if anybody else gets these, but I get the updates for the word of the day on dictionary.com. So I saw it one day and it came up. I was like, that is exactly how I feel about myself. And the word itself means a someone who travels alone, but enjoys it. Um, and so I was like, oh my gosh, this is me. But sometimes that can have a somber tone to the outside world, even though I'm enjoying it. Sometimes people can be like, oh, I don't know, I don't know you know, whatever. But I was like, well, this is definitely me. Um, so those three songs are super special. Um, only one of them had I ever performed live. Usually I perform my songs live and then record them. But this time I was like, nope, we're just gonna get this done. Um, I love that EP. It's very near and dear to my heart because I was in a, well, I had a band for 10 years. And then I decided that June that it was time for me to move on from the band. Love those guys, but it was time for me to try something new. And that's what happened with the Salivagon EP. Um, so it was just September, I went June and then September, I recorded the first single and then recorded the other two. Um, and then, so I love, I love that EP. Um, I have poetry with the EP that I put with it, um, because I was getting to the point where I wanted to share my poetry more. And with these songs and the poems that I was writing, it felt, it felt right to share them both at the same time. by you Um, 
Now, Space and Timing is a song that I wrote when I was at a residency at the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning um, in Jamaica, Queens. And I had a month residency there just to write. They gave me space and time to write. Um, and so it's funny that I say that because the, the, the song at first was called Letter to You because it was about a boy. Um, and then I started talking about have it like these people I'm grateful for because they gave me the space and the time to be myself. And so I decided to call it space and timing um, because you know you gotta have the space and you also have to have the timing because sometimes you might have the space with somebody but the time is off um, or vice versa. So it really, I love that song. And I did that song in a session with um, Jason Marshall's band. Uh, Jason Marshall's a baritone saxophone player in New York. Um, and I did that song on with a session uh, for his album. Didn't go on the album, but it, it was recorded. So I was like, uh, I'm taking this and we're gonna, I'm gonna keep that and release it for myself. Um, so that was a really special session. A lot of the guys that were in that session were also in the sessions I had for the EP. So it was wonderful. Um, those songs are really near and dear to my heart because they are so, I feel free when I sing them. And I feel free when I wrote them because it really feels like I'm coming more into my own in my writing as I progress in this craft that I will never be, I don't think I'll ever be like there because you're always growing and learning, but it feels great to be where I am and have these songs be written because they just feel good to me. Even the sad ones feel good to me. I don't know if that's weird, but. I totally get it. I totally get it, man. I just want to throw out there, you know, that I remember we had a music teacher who asked us, he asked us a question. He said, will we ever run out of songs? Mm. And um, at the time, I really didn't know the answer. And, you know, we went back and forth, my friends and I. But when you think about it, music is something that God has created. And because God is eternal, can we ever run out of a song? He's eternal. So music is eternal. And just like you said, we eternally discover more and more things about it. And I think that's the beautiful, unique thing about the gift of music. Um, but that being said, I have like three questions that like hit me, bam, 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 as you were speaking. And I guess I'll start with uh, Jeanette Berry and the Soul Nerds. So can you can you tell us a little bit about um, the group that you had for 10 years and what kind of prompted you, you know, you can tell us a little bit about the joys of that as well as what prompted you to now pursue a solo career? Jeanette Berry and the Soul Nerds was born in a South Philly living room. Um, and it was born from my partner in crime at the time, Ian Raffalak, who I had written, who I had written my first EP with. Um, he was the one that really said, Jeanette, you should be continuing to write songs because after my, I, I had to write an original song for my senior recital. I had never written music before, granted, M music or songs. I hadn't written before my senior year in college. Um, so after I wrote, I wrote two songs for that. And then I just start continue to write. And Ian was like, I wanna write with you. We should do this. And I was like, yes, let's do it. Um, and so we started a, a trio um, and then as the, and that was just like a jazz trio gigging around the city. And then um, as we continued to write, we we're like, we should get a band together. And so we just called people up from UArts and we're like, hey, you wanna be in a band? And um, so we did, and we had our first gig at um, Silk City on October 14th. It was, I don't remember the date. I feel like it was 2010. Um, so yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Anwar Marshall was the drummer and we were trying to talk, we were talking about how, like what we would name ourselves. And, you know, and I wanted to be very intentional with the music because I wanted to make sure that whatever music we played and whatever style that we were honoring was truly honored. And we weren't, we weren't, um, what's the word? We weren't taking it on and mocking it 
or doing it a disservice. So we always did our research. We always, you know, we were nerds in the way of, we're gonna talk about the deepest cut on a record or whenever we're hanging out and having dinner, like at Govinda's, we would talk about music and we would talk about these things. So we were the soul nerds and, and Amor was like, well, why, why don't we be the soul nerds? I was like, ah, it's amazing. So we became Jeanette Brain, the soul nerds because I wanted to be the soul nerds. And they were like, no, you have to have your name on it. I was like, all right, whatever. Um, so that was um, an amazing journey. Um, we got to record at um, Converse Rubber Track Studio. We got the chance to, we gigged a lot. We gigged a lot in New York. We gigged a lot in Philly. Um, we gigged a lot. Um, we started gigging in DC. Um, we got to play amazing shows. Um, record the the recording the album was the best i think one of the best experiences i've ever had because we we had been playing the songs for so long that we just got in the studio of course we had a plan but we got into the studio and just did it and we recorded like eight songs in a day in eight in eight hours which i think it should be um like if you're if you're planning and like you got it together like this is a job so we're gonna do it but it was so much fun um and so it just, it was, it was a great learning experience because that was the first time I was ever leading a band. Ian was the MD, but like to be able to lead a band and to be able to communicate with people that I felt were my peers um, about the music that I made, like to listen to my music come to life was an absolute joy. Um, so yeah, and it was it was a wonderful ride. Um, it just what happened was I moved to I moved back to New York, and you know we were all splintering off. People had babies, wives, husbands, and like it was fine. It was great, but because of all of those things, I was I was one of the only ones that was in the band that was single, no kids. So I was like, there are things that I want to do that I like. I think the time has moved on from Jeanette Berry and the Soul Nerds, and I need to do this by myself, not only musically, but just also to be like, I can do this. Secondly, because I don't want to have to say no to things because I need you and I don't want you to have to, you know, sacrifice this. Like, it's not like we're not friends. It's not like we can't make music together anymore. It's just the ending of an era and the beginning of a new one. Wow, back to that space and timing. <laughs> um, I want to give a shout out uh, to Mr. Ian, one of the baddest upright bass players in the Philadelphia area, and a shout out to Anwar, who also went to UR, an amazing, amazing percussionist, um, both amazing, talented musicians, um, as well as everyone else that was in the band. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know he plays the guitar too, he, Ian. So he actually got his undergrad, I think, in guitar. Um, as well as like as it, it just regular guitar as well as um, bass upright bass and bass guitar. Um, so yeah, he plays guitar. We wrote a lot together on guitar. He plays keys. We wrote with keys like he and I. Um, yeah, Ian's crazy. That band. So the first iteration of that band was Ian Raffalak, um, Amar Marshall, Brett Kynard, um, and Nick Bachrath on guitar. Um, and I knew, I knew when we started the band that would have many, many iterations because I always wanted to have the best people playing the gigs. So if somebody wasn't available, I knew that I had to go with somebody else. But, and, and so it was just a wonderful thing. And anybody that has ever played a gig with the band, I'm like, well, you're a soul nerd now. Like, that's just what it is. Um, you're a soul nerd now. That's awesome. Well, I can't forget Brett either. <laughs> Brett is awesome yeah. and amazing as well. Wow, that's amazing. I had no I, I clue. I, I saw, um, I was watching one of the videos where Ian was playing the guitar. I was like, well, I didn't know. <laughs> I only ever seen him play the upright bass. But wow, he's just so gifted and talented. Amazing, amazing. Uh, we give you our love and our hellos if you're watching. Um, awesome. Now, could you share one of your po pieces of poetry with us yeah. today? Yeah. While you're looking, I just wanted to say that I had 
no clue. I would have thought that you had been writing all your life, had been writing poetry, had been writing music. And it wasn't until you mentioned that it wasn't until your senior year in college, mind you, that it was your first time not only writing music, but writing uh, songs. Wow. I, I had no clue. Look at, look at how far you've come. Oh my goodness. I, yeah. I, I used to write poetry um, because it, it or, and stories. Uh, that was something that I did um, when I was younger. Um, and, uh, and then it just, you know, I didn't think I could write music. And then one day, it actually came to me um, and I was like, oh snap, this is, this is cool and I love this. And, it, and it's like the freedom that I always wanted. So I'm gonna continue this. So this poem is called, That's the Thing. That's the thing about love, it rarely dies because what we know of death is definite, a void, but love, it swells the more you pour into it. And when the people on either side of the love depart, what's left is memories, stories, the recollection of the scent they wore when you told them you lost your job, the shirt they wore when they first told you to have the last wing, the pair of shoes they wore that night out of nowhere where the sky opened up and cried all the tears you no longer had when you gave them back their key. Love doesn't die, it lives in our being. And if it's lucky, we use the love, the stories as a guide. Love exists. Thank you. That was very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Beautiful. So, You've had quite a bit of songwriting under your belt now. So I think I can ask you this question. What kind of writer would you say you are? I am a wordy writer. I've gotten a lot less wordy, but I still am a wordy writer because I truly believe in the power of lyrics. Um, I believe in, so lyrics are very important to me because I, they tell a heightened part of the story that the melody can't always tell. If you're going to sing a lyric, it's a heightened version of the story that you wanna tell, I believe. Um, I write very, uh, what's the word? Um, I am an, I'm an emotional writer. Um, I try to write about the things that make us all the same. Um, I am an, I mean, I love Stevie Wonder. He's one of my biggest influences as a writer. So I try to be the best storyteller I can be um, with whatever is placed inside me and what, with whatever the song wants. Um, I'm a firm believer that I'm not actually writing the song. The song has already been written. It's just being filtered through me and my perspective and experience, so. I'm a writer who takes a back seat to the song and tries to be very patient with the song and the poem itself and just let it come and let it be finished when it says it's finished, not when I say it's finished, so. I love it. I, I'm in total agreement with you. I think lyrics are so important. And um, I think what you say matters. And, um, you know, nowadays with, there's so many, I don't know if I want to say fruitless songwriting or it's just like there, I'm not sure what they're saying, if they're saying anything at all, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's excellent. I'm so glad that you still cherish that and you still carry that in what you do. My goodness, we're almost out of time, but I know and I have so many more questions I want to ask. We'll have to do a part two. <laughs> Um, but I, I saw in your biography that you had toured with Lauren Hill. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, that was... <clears throat> It was two and a half years. I was on tour as a background singer for Miss Lauren Hill. Um, I was a tenor on that tour. I, had I hadn't really sung tenor before. I auditioned as an alto, but then she asked me, can you sing tenor? And I was like, yes. I didn't know if I could or not, but of course you're gonna say yes. Um, 
So I said yes. And it was one of, I mean, it was firstly an amazing experience. Um, she was the first concert that I ever went to. Um, so it was really amazing that it was the first call for a background singer that I got. Um, I thought that that meant a lot to me. Um, I learned a lot being on the road. I learned a lot being in rehearsals around her, um, how to run things, how to say what you want, um, how to express that and be truly confident in what you want. Um, as, a, as a musician, that's re that was really important to me because I wasn't always like that. I always, I, there were times where I was just like, yeah, all right, that's fine. Um, but you have to take ownership of it. And she really showed me how to take ownership of my stuff, um, music especially. Um, I mean, I got to tour the world. Um, I didn't really get past, you know, as far as geography goes, I didn't get past Portugal, but like I've been to Portugal, Africa, Jamaica, all around the country. Um, and that wouldn't have been possible without that. So. Um, your gift really does make room for you. And that was an amazing two and a half years of my life, um, performing with The Roots and like just having great stories, great fun, learning a lot and being able to have my gift take me around the world and only have to have one job for like the first time in my life. That was also wonderful. Um, so yeah, those, it was great. It was great. Wow, that is so powerful. What a privilege and an honor. How, how did that come about? So you just applied and you received? No. Um, <laughs> so I got an email from someone who was in touch with her liaison at Sony that was saying they were holding private auditions. And they said, I would be perfect for it. They want somebody that's hardworking, humble, of course, talented. Um, so I was like, okay, bet went to the auditions. I was living in New York at the time. I went to the auditions in Conshohocken and I forgot that my friend was already playing bass with her, Ra. Um, um, so he was already on the gig. And so I was just like, oh, this is great. I was like, hey, how are you? I was like, oh, this is nice. Um, and went through, the, went through the audition process. And when I was in, I was visiting my brother in Providence and I got the call. And they were like, hey, we'd like to bring you on as tenor for Miss Hill. There's still some like audition-y stuff or whatever. Not, I, they didn't really say that, but there was just like, it was kind of still preliminary. Like, we're going to see how you do on this first gig and we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, that was, it was wild. It was wild because it was a day I actually had an event in New York that I was hosting. So I went to the audition and it was, I thought it was done. I was like, all right, I got to run back to New York. And I was taking the train and Ra calls me. He's like, nah, she wants to come back. So I was literally getting on the train to New York. I had to run back to get on the train back to Conshohocken um, and went back and then got back to New York with time to do the event. So I won't forget that day. It was hilarious and amazing. <laughs> Wow, that is an amazing story. Shout out to Ra if you're watching as well. <laughs> oh my gosh, wow. What an incredible story. You are an incredible woman. Thank you so much, Ms. Jeanette, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. This has been amazing. Thank you for letting me share and tell some of these stories. Absolutely. Man, stories are so powerful. Well, before we close, I'd like to do something we call the Fast Five. And then after which we want you to let us know how we can reach out to you, connect with you, connect with your music, where people can buy the EP. You guys, check it out. I'm telling you, beautiful, phenomenal. As, as she already expressed, heartfelt music, heartfelt lyrics, so you don't want to miss it. Are you ready for your Fast Five? Yes. <laughs> don't be nervous. Everyone's always nervous, but I'm telling you, it, it's not a big deal. Okay. So once again, the fast five, we ask you five questions. You have five seconds to answer them. So question number one, what is your favorite instrument? Cello. Okay, cello. Can you tell us why? My dad played it and then I played it for nine years. It's, uh, I love the sound of it. Uh, it's a beautiful instrument. Wow, <laughs> you are a Jill of all trades, I tell you. 
Number two, who is a musician who you admire? Ah, uh, so many. Um, I, you know, right now I would say PJ Morton. Nice. Did you want to elaborate? I think he's amazing. He's been writing and doing it for so long. Um, and he seems to keep his voice. Um, and I just love his writing style. So yeah, totally. PJ. Excellent. That's a good choice. Number three, what is your favorite type of food? Fruit. I like fruit as well. Number four, how would you prefer to pass your free time? <laughs> um, uh, reading. <laughs> Was that because if there is any free time? Yes. I know the feeling. <laughs> Number five, uh, what is one thing you would say to an aspiring songwriter? There's no such thing as writer's block. Um, listen to the song that you're writing. There's no such thing as writer's block. Um, sometimes a song just stops. Sometimes the moment is passed, but it's not a block. Um, continue to simply just write on the page or type on the page, um, but allow yourself to be a vessel for the song. There's no such thing as writer's block. Excellent. I love it. Oh my goodness. Well, Ms. Jeanette Berry, this has definitely been a valuable time um, passed together. Um, and again, we are so thankful. Before we close out, can you please tell our audience and our, our audience members where they can find you, where they can find your work, and um, how they can support you? You can find all of my stuff at JeanetteBerry.com. So my name.com, easy. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at JB underscore soul nerd, still with the soul nerd. I'll forever and always be a soul nerd. Um, I'm, and then I have another website for my writing. In the new year, um, one of my goals is to write more music reviews. Um, so I have a website for that, Constellation Noir, um, and that's Noir with an E for the feminine kind. Um, and yeah. So that's where you can find me. I'm all over, I'm all over the place, but JeanetteBerry.com, Instagram, Twitter, at JB underscore soul nerd and constellationnoir.com. Wonderful. And if we'd like to purchase your music? Bandcamp is the best way to go. Um, JeanetteBerry.bandcamp.com. All of the music I've ever recorded is under JeanetteBerry.bandcamp.com. Okay, excellent. That's awesome. Do you still have a podcast? I'm producing two podcasts. I don't have my own anymore, but that's something else that I'd like to revisit in the new year. Um, as we get going more, I'd like to explore that again. Okay. Oh my goodness. Excellent. Well, guys, be on the lookout for that, bro uh, for that broadcast, for that podcast. You guys want to hear what she has to say. Oh, wow. This has been excellent. An excellent interview. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for um, giving of us of your time. And um, yeah, thank you. Is there any last words that you'd like to say? Thank you, first of all, for this. Um, keep at it. Surround yourself with people that support you and take time to understand who you are um, so that whatever art you're doing can be as authentic and um, true as possible. Perfect. Those are sound words of wisdom from Ms. Jeanette Berry herself. <laughs> tweet that so <laughs> we love you we love you guys thank you again for watching my name is renee west with alia school of art please like us find us on facebook and instagram at alia school of art that's a-l-i-y-a-h or check us out at our website www.aliaschoolofart.com where we are impacting our community's social emotional spiritual and physical needs through arts and education bye bye now be your one and only I will
will always be worthwhile. I will never hold you like I've dreamed of. I was never meant to be by your side. Glances, dreams, and Conversations, songs I'll never sing again. Words have lost all power. Compassion, when I realized us, will never end because I. Was never meant to stand by your side, 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 by your side. Never meant to be by your side. Nights were filled with long, long conversations. Faces hurt from smiling all night. Our words were never lies or fake, but what's now we always knew we'd never be side by side days i beam with hope of one day seeing the face that often invades my dreams by day by night and hour Second and minute, time has been my guide to show me that.